answered that prayer. Hallelujah. Praise his name. And uh, that's what we pray. And I, I told you all that this, this show probably sets the course for their entire year. So we're happy they had a good show. And we're, I'm just I always amazed what God does and through his people. And that's what we're going to see today. But Carol, would you come and read my, the text for today? Good morning, everybody. If you'd please stand for the reading, I'm going to read Philippians 2, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Both to, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts. We love you, we honor you, we want to be near you, dear Lord. Let us bring people that don't know you, bring them to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You did. I did. I knew I would. That's the reason I asked. So nice. Turn my mic. I did. I caught Carol off guard. I usually give it to her a little bit before, but I appreciate her willingness to read God's Word. It's always a blessing. Amen. That's what Gavin and I were talking about in Sunday school this morning, how God's Word will impact how we look at the world uh, and the things that we make decisions based on God's Word. I want to set a little context for the passage that we read in this Philippians. So we know that Paul was in prison. And this verse is very powerful if we look at how we live our lives. Uh, many of us have made choices and decisions through our lives that have found us kind of in the the briar patch, if you will. It's caused us to have grief and have us to make uh, str have struggles and, and not to be able to do the very thing that God it created us for, and that was to bring glory to Him. Our job as Christians, as we talked about last week, uh, is to glorify the Lord. And what we do and how we are observed by the world, we have to make sure, and, and this verse... Knowing that Paul was in prison, and he's writing to the church in Philippi, he's encouraging them to live a life that's with Jesus, a life that is in Christ. It's a life that, that he used God's word to in, in, in allow him to do the very things that God in, it wanted him to do, the reason he was cr created and put on this earth. And that all being said, in there at the end it says, even if I'm a poured, a, a poured out as a drink offering, he knew that he was about to die. He's about to have his, you know, he was going to be beheaded. But he's telling them to live a life that glorifies God. To live a life, and that's the reason why I like that song, Jesus at a, at a Distance we got to add that no more at the front of it. And I want us to get to the place in our lives that we have a life with Jesus. So I want to challenge us today. Um, I want us to see, what, is a life with Jesus even possible? You know, you say, well, preacher, you know that answer. And the, the short answer is yes. Short answer is yes, we can live a life with Jesus. We can live a life and know that he's right there with us around every corner, around every uh, problem that we might have. 
But the problem is that we go through life and we tend to, all right, Jesus, you stand here in the background. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to make this choice. I'm going to go down this path. I want you to follow me instead of us following Jesus. And I believe if we would get to the place that we look for Jesus, and I want us to look at these verses today in a very clear way. I've been challenged myself, um, but to know that Jesus is with me. Instead of me looking at Jesus at a distance, I want him to be right there. And I've preached to you and taught you that if you'll just put him first in your life, you'll make better decisions. Amen. And he will have your back, so to speak. He will take care of the needs. He said, if you ask anything in my name, according to the Father's will, I will give it to you. We, we have to get to the place that we do want Jesus with us. A life with Jesus. And that's what I titled my sermon, A Life with Jesus. Not for the help that he brings, not for the very things that he, he, he blesses us with, not the trouble he gets us out of, but as a friend, as a brother. And I love that picture just with his arms wrapped around me. And I want you to have that too. I want you to have the experience of knowing who Jesus is, but to know that he is right there with you. Are you there? You see, what it is is that in our lives we have three words that I, I sat there and I looked and I, I said, why do people not want to have Jesus close to, to lead them, to give them what they need? And I came up with three words, and those words are fear, faith, and sacrifice. We're afraid if we get too close to Jesus, we might get called to teach a Sunday school class. If we get too close to Jesus, we might be asked to go to some foreign mission field. People are afraid to serve. They're afraid to do the very things he's called us to do. They're afraid to even acknowledge his name at times. And because of our faith being sometimes not what it ought to be, we don't know God's word well enough that we can say, I trust this, I believe this, this is what I have my faith based upon. I make my decisions based on the faith that I know that Jesus is there with me. And then the sacrifice. I know I'm guilty. The years that I spent in vanity and pride, knowing that my Lord was crucified. The things that I strove to obtain, the toys, the, the big house, the, the, the monetary things that we call very important in our lives. Sometimes we need to sacrifice ourselves. But I want to take a few moments and know that this is very true in our lives. Real fear is very real. The last five years I have seen it. I've sensed it. I've even felt it. I, but I know that Jesus is close by my side. And without it, I would have been crippled and unable to make the right decisions of life and to bring glory to God. In the last five years as your pastor, there was times I said, is this really what God wants me to do? And if Jesus had not been with me, I would not have been able to say, yes, this is why I am in New Mexico. Faith, my faith is tested. And that's the reason why James chapter 1 uh, we read, count it all joy, my brothers, when you are meet, meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Every wind of this world that blows, sometimes I see Christians just getting blown left and right. But if we have Jesus in, and we have faith in what he's going to do, it will make us stand fast. And it says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Isn't that what we'd like to have in our lives? That's, that's kind of taking care of our fleshly desires. But it takes having faith in what Jesus is going to do. And then that word sacrifice, that's, a, that's an earthly word. It's all because of the things that transpired here on earth. Jesus had to sacrifice his throne to come here to be made flesh, to live a life and show us how to live sacrificially. 
So many will not sacrifice because of the cost. Romans 12, 1, Paul says, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice that you may prove what is good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. I think sometimes we have pulled away from Jesus because of that, just like the song says. We want him to stand off in the distance and be re ready so if I say help, he'll come running. I don't want him to see the things I don't do that I should be doing. I don't want him to see the things that I do do that I shouldn't be doing. Paul talks all about that. I'm not gonna, that's another message for another day. But I want us to have Jesus right there with us. He sees everything anyway. Why don't we surrender to that fact and put away the fear, have the faith, and sacrifice what's in the way of that? Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that Jesus has our best interest in his mind. And what that passage says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of welfare and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So in the next few moments, I want to share some verses with you, a lot of verses. They're on your, I may read through them, you may not catch some of it. They're on the bulletin. I'm sure some of you looked at the back of the bulletin, my outline is there, and they said, oh my goodness, he's got a lot of scripture. I'm not going to give you my words a lot today. I want you to hear God's words. And I want you to hear it in a way that you can set tomorrow when the trials of life come, as James said they will. I want you to be able to say, yes, I'm glad I heard that message because I, now I have a weapon, just like Jesus used against Satan. I have scripture. And I pray you'll take and read these passages. It'd be, you've got enough air to have something every day of this week. Meditate on it, study it, and learn it. But I want us to consider this. What would life be like if I lived it close to Jesus? What would life be like if I knew that Jesus was right there? And it's not that he's not there. It's that you don't recognize him. Amen. You don't want to be near him at times. Well, I want to do this, Lord. You need to kind of go over there and let me do my thing. <laughs> But yet when we get in trouble because we made that decision, we'll yell Jesus just like Peter did in the water. He was walking on water doing the things that Jesus wanted him to do. He said, come. And he got out on the water and he started walking. But yet what happened? He saw the storms of life and he started sinking. And he said, help, O oh, ye of little faith. I hope I encourage you today and I give you what you need. I know it has helped me. And I want you to to leave here today strong in the Lord, strong in His Word, strong in the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that the devil just doesn't have a chance. Amen? Point number one, what would my fear look like if I was close to Jesus? In verses 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only is in my presence, but also is it, it, it more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, the definition that we like to look at fear is fear of something that makes us not want to do it. We have taken the, the meaning of fear, and, and a lot of times people think we, we're, we're to be scared of God, and that's not the case. Fear comes when you have don't gone against God. And I want us to have the fear that we obey God. Amen. My dad used to say something. He said, you need to do this. And I knew if I didn't do this, there were repercussions. That's the respect that God in, expects from us is to fear his authority in a way that we are obedient. But not that it's a, a means of being frightful. But it's that we are fearful at, that we're not doing enough. That is where the turning point in my life was. You see, fear is being alone. We read that in Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, 
for I'm, uh, I, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You will have fear if you have the absence of God and you'll be alone. Fear comes when you f uh, your, your flame is going out. When you don't, when you don't fan the fa flame. You see, you, you don't come to Sunday school. You don't come to church. You don't read God's words. You don't talk to God. You start having these fear and, and, and it's because you don't have a flame in you, the Holy Spirit. And we read that in 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 and 7. It says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of the hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Man, what an example we would have if we would let God's word just flame up in our lives and not have to worry about those things. But fear is not looking for Jesus. You see, when we stop looking for Jesus, we find ourselves all alone. I remember one time my son, we were at a mall. And I could see him, and he would kind of pulled away from me. And he was off running around. And I just kind of backed up a little bit and hid, hid in the shadows. Until he realized, I'm all alone. And he did what we do as Christians. He started, Mama, Daddy. He was all alone. He couldn't see us. He didn't know where we were at. He needed his parents. He needed his father with him. He wanted his hand back in my hand. And that is what we find And when we read Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. My son come running up. I, I just kind of stepped out and he could see me. And he come running up and jumped up in my arms. You know, the rest of the day, he never pulled away from me, not once. He might have had to learn that trick a time or two through his young life. But we do the same. It doesn't mean that God stops looking for us. We need to be looking for him. Fear is also a snare of man. In, in, in Proverbs 29, verse 25, it says, Fear of man lays a snare. The fear of man lays a snare. So many times we're afraid of how man looks at us. So many times we're afraid of how, how we are looked at if we even say the name of Jesus, much less live like Jesus, especially in the world that we live in today. But Jesus told us we're to be the light of the world, the salt of the world. We're to be different. And that can be fearful at times. But the proverb goes on, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. See, we put the fear of man into what we make our decisions on. But if we fear the Lord and we look for Jesus and what he's watching us do, it will help us and we will be safe. Matthew 10, 28 also says, and do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So we need to be firemen as we go along too. My dad was a fireman. And, you know, we think about running into a fire. And he was fearful. He respected that fire. But he ran into the fire to help people that were going to die if he didn't. Do we have that same understanding of fear that we understand the presence of God and we do what he asks us to do? We go into this dark world making disciples, looking for those to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what Matthew 28 tells us to do, correct? Yeah. We're to go out and find people, tell them about Jesus, not being afraid or fearful of how they're going to look at us, how they're going to receive what we try to give them. And it's a free gift of salvation. God does all the work. We're just messengers. But praise the Lord, I am so thankful that people poured into me and that they went into the burning life that I had, even as an eight-year-old boy, brought me out and set me in the safety where Jesus was. Fear of the Lord is satisfaction, though. I believe that we need to get to the place that we look to Jesus and know that if we fear his presence in a way that we respect, that we desire to put a smile on his face. That's my fear. 
I'm going to make mistakes. I try not to. God, Jesus said, be holy. And that's what we need to try to do. Do everything we can. Read the word. Talk to God. Be available. And do the things that he's called us to do. But it brings satisfaction if we do those things. Proverbs 19, 23. Fear the Lord leads to life. My life completely changed when I stopped fearing what was going on in the world and started looking to God and Jesus to be with me along the way. And whoever has his, its rest satisfied, he will not be visited by harm. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher. Jesus said you're going to be persecuted and you're going to find these troubles in the world. But it says, it says you'll not be visited by harm. You can go to Psalm 91, read that this week sometime. The protection that if we find ourselves in that holy place with God Almighty, and the only way you can be there is through Jesus. My fear is that I'm not doing enough to glorify God. Whose kingdom are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the kingdom here on earth? Or are you looking to the kingdom in heaven? I want us to understand that we don't have to have fear of man. And we need to look to God and we'll have Jesus by our side. Point number two, what would my faith look like if Jesus was close by? Verses 14 through 16, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Some of us need to underline that in our Bibles. That you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as a light in the world, holding fast to the word of life. And why we do that? So that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor. Paul's writing this to the church there in Philippi, but he could be very well Jesus writing it to you and me as Christians. I believe sometimes we, we lose the understanding and we, we say, well, that was for a church some 2,000 years ago. It sounds very much like 2023 to me. Right. We're going through a life, and how are we going to do that if we don't have faith in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary? What if you looked at faith as a direction or directive as to the purpose of Jesus? Let me say that again, because I don't think we get that a lot of time. If we look at faith as a directive as to the purpose of Jesus, that means eternity past, present, and future. Everything that happens, Romans 8, 28, everything happens to the good of those that, uh, that love the Lord and are called according to what? His purpose. You got to love him. You got to do those things. You got to glorify him. You got to do that. How does your faith point you and others to Jesus? Can you answer that question? How many times have you used your faith this week to glorify the Lord? Not to get out of trouble. See, I believe sometimes we like the Lord to be like that genie. We rub the genie body. I, I, I need this. I need help with that. I think we need to look for Jesus. You know, a lot of people, when they think about heaven, they think about the streets of gold and all the, their family and friends that are there. You know what I think about when I think about heaven? I want to see Jesus' face. Amen. That's what I want to see. I, I want to see my Savior. The rest of it doesn't matter. I just know that He died for me. He gave me an opportunity to walk side by side with him instead of the other way around. So faith in who? Some of you may know the six serving men. Faith in who? In 1 Corinthians 2 we read, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. This is Paul talking but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power so that your faith might not rest in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. When we pray for somebody that is sick or in the hospital, we pray that God's will be done. We want them to be healed 
and we want their body to be made right. But sometimes God's will is that he brings them home. Man, what healing that is. Isn't that what Paul said? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But to live is what? Christ. To walk with Jesus. To have a life that is in Christ Jesus. Living a life that he left you here to do anyway. So that's who we need to have our faith in. In Jesus. And the power that he's given us. But why faith? Why do we need faith? Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith it's impossible to please him. To glorify him. To please him in a way that he smiles. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We've already said that in the other passage. You see, when you get around Jesus, you're going to get happy, even on a bad day. I have found that when I take and look to Jesus in the good stuff, I tell you when it's hardest to look for Jesus, when everything's just going okay. We sometimes say, thank you, Jesus, when things go good. Or if things are going really bad, we say, help me, Jesus. But if we're going through life every day and nothing's really exciting or anything, we tend to forget about Jesus. Right. I pray and thank him. I say, thank you for a boring day. Don't get many of them. I love it when I have one of those days. And I want us to get to the place that when we look and we have that faith and we say, why? It's because we want to please him with everything that we do. But faith in what? Ephesians 2 tells us, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That, uh, and it's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. If we're walking with Jesus, we're going to be doing his will. We're going to be doing good works. We sacrifice ourselves in a way that we can move forward and do the very bidding that he has left us here to do, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're to glorify the Lord. What better way to have that than to just walk with him? <laughs> Jesus, lead the way should be our way we get up every day. Lead me in the path of righteousness. Lead me through the fires. Lead me through the battles. Help me to dot that old lion's eye. You see, we can go through life with Jesus by our side, and we know what we have, but we got to believe. We have to have faith. When should we do that? 1 Peter 3 tells us, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sakes, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Have you ever been in a, having a bad day? And I've seen some of you do this. Margie, I always pick on her. It's not a pick. It's just I, I, I just appreciate her spirit. She goes through a lot, but she smiles. And she's got a smile that beats a lot of ours that don't have any problems because she has Jesus, and she looks to him. She looks for his direction. She looks for his presence in the bad and the good. But it goes on to say, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, other people talk about you. He's a goofball. He's a holy roller. He's whatever name you want to call or been called. That the, they will revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. I wish we would understand when we need to have faith. And that's at all times. And then where should we have this faith? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the convi uh, conviction of things not seen. I'm trusting the Lord's going to bring more people. We've got a lot of empty chairs in here today. Now, praise the Lord. We've got a lot of visitors today. I'm grateful for that. Amen. Some of our visitors just had not been here in a while. We're glad you're here today. But we should all be going out and telling them what we have faith in and where we found that faith. And if you're honest with yourself, it would come from somebody that shared the Bible with you, shared God's Word with you, that you understood who the Holy Spirit was. And that's what your faith is in. And when we come together, we become the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And we got, to, we, got, we got so much to look forward to. And when we do that, and we know where to do that, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. You see, we should be hoping to build the kingdom of God. And if we're doing our part to glorify God and tell about Jesus, then our faith is going to be a way in a, in a way that we'll have faith that, that Jesus will give us the word. Didn't, didn't Jesus say the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak? He will help you to remember the things that I've said so that you may do the will of God. Yeah. We need to fill this place up. And how do we do that? How do we have that kind of faith? Well, Proverbs 3, starting with verse 5. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. I'm sorry. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. That's what we like to do. We like to figure it out and tell people what we think instead of what God said. Paraphrasing is okay if you keep it in the context of what God says. Amen. I think we need to do a better job of that. In all our ways, acknowledge Him. When people say, why you got a smile on your face? Because Jesus is right here with me. How did you go through that trauma? Because Jesus was with me. Amen. How did you make it through your finances? I can, I can remember one time in my younger days, I sat down and did the math one time. I was writing my, I finally learned that I give my, my, my tithe and offerings. I give that first. I give that to God first. And then I try to figure out what happens with the rest. Now, a lot of people would tell you, pay your bills and then give God what's left over. You see, when you get to the place that you walk with Jesus, you have faith that he's going to supply your needs, right? What's Matthew 6, say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So when I got to the place that I would sit there and do it, and I've done the math, I don't know how I made it through the month, especially the first couple of years I was here. But God always took care of the bills. There's been a many a time I'd get a bill here in New Mexico. And I said, Judy, we, now, we don't got enough money to pay this. And she'd look at me and she'd say, God will provide. And sure enough, within a day, I'd get a call. Hey, I got a bathroom. I need some tiles replaced in my bathroom. And he'd pay the bill that I needed to do. You see how God takes care of us. We have faith that he's going to do it. And how we do this is by saying, Jesus is with me. And use that faith. Not like a genie, but trust him to make better decisions based on his word. When somebody makes you upset at church, you need to have faith in what Jesus is doing, not what the people are doing. When people sit there and they say, well, you ought to be doing it this way. Well, what's God's word say? I have faith in God's word, and that's what we're going to do here at First Baptist. We're going to talk about this in the business meeting. There's some things we need to be doing. There's some things that we need to, to maybe Fan the flames and get things going like we should be. Is our, is our faith everlasting with Jesus? Everything that we have faith in, does it, is it surrounded by, does it surround Jesus? Or just when things are going well? Point number three, what would my sacrifice look like if I was close to Jesus? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. There are things in this passage here, verses 17 and 18, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice offering of your faith. He was going to die because he was giving the word of God to these churches. And we, we, we have to get to the place that we sacrifice what we believe and get back to what Jesus says. And Paul went on to say, I am glad and rejoice with you. And likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. I can see why Paul was saying that. He was about to get to see Jesus face to face. I believe that sometimes we don't look at sacrifice the right way. What if we looked at sacrifice as a result of our personality through Jesus? That's what he's, Paul was saying in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. See, our sacrifice needs to be that we nail ourselves to the cross and allow Jesus to live through us. 
without holding back. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. How many times do we say, well, I wish I could invite somebody to church. I wish I could, I could have somebody to disciple. But we don't do anything sacrificially to reach anybody. We don't change our schedule to go talk to a neighbor. We don't look to somebody to say, can I help them? We don't recognize what this sacrifice is. We don't recognize that Jesus is wanting us. He, he said we'd be persecuted. He said that, but don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. And if we put aside that fear that we were talking about, we hold strong to that faith that we, we want, then our sacrifice will be representative of that. Matthew 6, 1 says, Beware of participating, uh, practicing your uh, righteousness before other men in order to be seen by them. How many times do you talk Jesus just to get attention? How many times should we talk about Jesus in order to reach somebody, to shine the light that he is? For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. You see, if all that we do points to Jesus, then he gets the honor and the glory. And I believe that's what our job is to do, is to get ourselves out of in front of Jesus. And sometimes that's what it is. Somebody's looking for Jesus, and we're saying, hey, look at what I'm doing. And that is not what God wants us to do. Scripture says that we're to be fruitful. And I believe that sometimes we look at that, and I said this the other day. I think sometimes we look so much about trying to lead somebody to the Lord, but we're not producing fruit. We're not living by the fruit of the Spirit that is what we are when we're fruitful. And what that does is it shows them Jesus through our lives. And then what they do is they say, well, I like that fruit. And they want to reach up and get a piece of it. And that's when you have the opportunity to introduce them to who Jesus is. And it comes without return. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So many times I hear people, I want to have a Bible study. I want to learn. I want to do this. And they never take what they learn in Bible study and use it out here in the streets. What good is God's word if we don't share it with the lost? Somebody use the word to share it with you. Or maybe you don't know that you're saved. God's word can make it very clear. I'd love to take the Bible and show you what it says about that. But it has purpose also. 2 Corinthians, the sacrifice that we have in 2 Corinthians 9, it says each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart. You see, you have to make up your mind what you're going to do for the Lord. And every time that it is going to be everlasting, I will guarantee you there will be sacrifice involved. Well, you're meddling now, preacher. No, I'm just trying to help you. I know it's helped me. If we sit there and count the cost, what did it cost Jesus? He gave up a throne in heaven to be made flesh and come here and be a sacrifice to die on an old rugged cross that was meant for thieves and murderers. He did that for you and me. He sacrificed it all. And he goes on to say, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Are you happy about the sacrifice? Paul, when he wrote this, he was about to be beheaded. He was in prison. But he's saying, be happy. Are we happy about the sacrifices that we make? And we're given the greatest example, and that's through Jesus. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that not what we're looking for? A life that glorifies God. Amen. That should be our goal. And if that is the case, then our sacrifice is with promise. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. 
God is not stingy when it comes to blessing. You glorify God, I'll guarantee you, you will receive a blessing. You, you know, you've heard the saying, you know, let the windows of hope, heaven open up upon your life. You've got to open that window up with Jesus first. That relationship that you have to live a life with Jesus along the way. The last sentence in that verse, it says, For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to use, to you. So think about that. And when next time you say, well, that's going to cost me a lot of things. It's going to cost me some time. It's going to cost me maybe some friends. But if it's about Jesus, it's well worth it. And when you do that, you know what he does? Sean, of all people today, one of our homeless guys, and Gavin and me were back there and Sean was wanting to, he just being shown. And he says, you know, Job, he gave everything and God give it back tenfold. And he didn't know what I was preaching. He didn't want to hear what I had to preach. But here's the thing. He's right. You see, Job knew that Jesus, he didn't know who Jesus was. He knew the Lord. He knew God. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't have God's word that we have. But he knew that if he sacrificed everything, God would put it back tenfold. But we got to measure everything out with a measure. And I believe that's such a true verse there as Luke wrote it. Give abundantly. Sacrifice. Don't worry about what it takes. Share Jesus. So I asked you a question earlier. What would life be like if we lived close to Jesus? What would it be like? In my application, it's there in your bulletin. Life would be with kingdom purpose. Life would be everlasting, and life would be Jesus. Isn't that what we're challenged to do? Manifest the body of Christ? That's what the church's job is. If we're going to walk with Jesus, we need to be Jesus here. We're to be his body. I don't think we get that sometimes. Galatians 2.20, I haven't used it in a while, but it's one of my favorite verses. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What a life we would have if we would live it with Jesus. Nail ourselves to the cross. And allow him to enter us through the Holy Spirit and live a life through us. Touching those that we come in contact with all the time. I'm not saying you got to take the Bible and beat them over the head. Live without fear. Live with the fear that you're doing what God has put you here to do. And that you're going to do everything that you can to make sure it does right. Live in a faith that you trust what he has said and promised us. And then to sacrifice in a way that they see that sacrifice that you give to live and be Jesus. It sounds pretty hard, but all it is is a matter of surrender. Our psalm that we read this morning, Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. Life with Jesus, we, he said he would make it known. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and your right hand is pleasures forevermore. You want a good life? Live it with Jesus. Amen. Amen? But you have to want it. You have to desire that. You have to make up your mind. And I guarantee you, your heart will be touched. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you that you don't leave it for us to figure out. We thank you that you have given us your son. Let us believe that. Let us believe the truth of your word. Let us have faith that it will keep us. And we would be stable in all that we do. But Lord, let us sacrifice our own lives a living sacrifice that we might prove what is your perfect, acceptable, goodwill. I thank you 
that you trust us with this message, this truth, in a way that you want us to teach others. Even if we feel we're not qualified, you can teach somebody through us. I've heard it said you, you can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. Lord, I pray that we would be drawing straight lines. Straight lines to Jesus. Touch our hearts where we need to be touched. Change our lives that we would get on the path that Jesus is on. And if there be somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they would not leave this place without somebody being able to take the Bible and show them what they have to do to be saved. Touch our hearts as only you can do through your Holy Spirit. And we ask this all in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I surrender all. We all know the words. The words will be on the screen. I'll be here at the front. If you need to come and pray, I'll be here. If you don't know if you're saved or not, please ask me. I'd love to get somebody to take the Bible or I'll take the Bible myself and show you what he did for you. But do not leave this place.